Okay, uh, it's probably time to start. Um, today, it's a great pleasure to have Gus Schroeder on Global Poisson, and he will be speaking on the chromatic Lagrangian. So, Gus. Okay, well, yeah, yours. thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Anton, um, uh, for yeah for the invitation to speak in the in the webinar. Um, so so yeah, the, the the topic of my my talk is going to be some joint um, oops, how do I ah, so some joint work in progress with Lin Hui Shen uh, and Eric Zaslow, um, and uh, we uh, hoping the paper will be out relatively soon to to archive. Um, but in the meantime, if if you're curious for any more details or to sort of Follow along. There's a, there's a draft version available on my um, on my website. So um, to to sort of start with a bit of an overview of the goal of the the project, um, you um, might kind of summarize it as an attempt to use uh, Poisson geometry of uh, certain moduli spaces in order to make some predictions about what seems like a rather unrelated kind of problem in enumerative geometry. Um, and so uh, these, uh, uh, the, the particular kind of problem in enumerative geometry is gonna be one related to open Grimm of Witten invariance of Lagrangian submanifolds in standard K less C3. So, so real uh, three dimensional, uh, uh, Lagrangian submanifolds in uh, T star of R3, if you like. Uh, and the uh, Poisson moduli spaces that we're going to use to, to make predictions about these open Grimov Witten invariants uh, will be moduli spaces of decorated local systems on surfaces. Uh, and the kind of key feature of their uh, Poisson geometry that we're going to exploit in order to make the connection to enumerative geometry is the cluster nature of that Poisson structure. Um, so, so the goal for the talk is to kind of explain um, uh, what that is and how we can, can use it to uh, try and understand some aspects of uh, open Grimm of Witten theory. So, so let me uh, start from the enumerative side and, and sort of say a few words about the enumerative problems we, we want to kind of study. Um, so, uh, so, so let's take X, um, as we said, to just be standard Kähler uh, C3. And uh, also, as we said, we'll be interested in understanding uh, Lagrangian submanifolds inside of, um, inside of X, inside of C3. And the ones we're going to be interested in are going to be non-compact. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, we should therefore fix some kind of boundary conditions for, for them at, at infinity, so to speak. And we're going to ask that they be asymptotic to a Legendrian surface lambda uh, in the cosphere bundle to R3, or if you like, in, in the five sphere sitting off at, at, at infinity. Um, so, so that's the basic setting. Um, and uh, so, so what is the idea of, of a Grimm of Witten theory? Um, in, in a setting like this, well, we have our, our X, um, some uh, kalabi yau manifold, and we're interested in, in counting, in some sense, uh, holomorphic maps uh, from Riemann surfaces uh, sigma, uh, potentially with some genus, uh, into our kalabi yau uh, manifold. Now, for us, we're going to be interested in Riemann surfaces uh, that are uh, uh, have, in fact, non-trivial boundary. Uh, and for us, we'll be uh, focused on the case where the boundary consists of just a single uh, component, which is just a, a single circle. Um, so, so when we have boundary, we should describe some, well, boundary conditions for our holomorphic maps. And those boundary conditions are described by, uh, by uh, Lagrangian uh, submanifolds L of our kalabi yau manifold. So, so what we can do is, is try to count uh, uh, holomorphic maps from our Riemann surface sigma to our Calabi R manifold X um, that map uh, the boundary of sigma uh, into our Lagrangian submanifold L. Okay, so, so uh, there's some sort of discrete uh, parameters upon which the, these counts uh, will depend, right? That they'll depend on the, on the genus of the, the Riemann surface. Um, They'll well, depend on the number of boundary components, which we have just said will fix to be one always. Um, and they'll also depend on the homology class of the image of that boundary circle inside of our Lagrangian submanifold. So, so that's some first homology class um, 
uh, integral first homology class in, in L. Um, and so in addition to this, this homology class, uh, which we call beta and this genus uh, H, uh, there's another uh, discrete parameter which enters the game um, uh, called the so-called open gromer witten framing. So, so let me, for the time being, uh, not say too much about precisely what it means. Uh, we'll, we'll come to it uh, momentarily, but for now, uh, let's keep it in mind as an additional uh, extra discrete piece of data uh, upon which the, these counts um, these uh, will depend. Okay, so um, from um, a sort of a perspective of physics, uh, what are these rational numbers, these rational counts, um, n, beta, h, a? So what they are is they're the sort of Taylor coefficients, so to speak, in the expansion of the free energy of a topological string whose boundary conditions are defined by this Lagrangian submanifold L. Okay, so, so we can take that free energy, we can expand it um, as a power series in uh, uh, sort of two variables, so to speak. One variable, X, recording the uh, homology class of the image of the boundary of the surface. Another genus counting parameter, uh, lambda. Um, and then these coefficients, um, uh, expansion coefficients, uh, are these, these uh, uh, open gromer wooden counts uh, we, uh, we just discussed. So that's a very nice physical uh, picture of, of what uh, these, these numbers mean. Um, unfortunately, from a mathematical perspective, it, uh, uh, th these counts are hard to give a, a, a rigorous definition of in, in any kind of generality. Um, and the, the, the sort of situation is, is much more complicated than that of uh, sort of usual closed uh, realm of Witten theory, where we don't have any boundary. Um, because of the kind of complicated uh, bubbling phenomena that can happen in these moduli spaces of uh, Riemann surfaces with boundary, right? So these counts are really uh, sort of integrals over a moduli space, and and uh, when you have this sort of nasty bubbling phenomena, it's uh, you have difficulty to define um, uh, what that uh, integral in fact means. So. Um, Unfortunately, there's as, as yet no uh, uh, general uh, mathematical definition of, of uh, these open group of wooden invariants um, outside of certain examples that we'll, we'll talk about uh, uh, momentarily. So, uh, but, but, but again, uh, leaving aside uh, uh, that issue and returning back to kind of uh, physics, uh, physical motivations, um, Uguri and Waffe discovered a, a really sort of beautiful way to repackage these rational uh, open group of wooden counts. Um, in terms of integer invariants um, that uh, now go by the name of Uguri Vafa invariants. And this repackaging um, comes from, uh, sort of goes in the following way, right? So, so, so rather than looking at the free energy uh, whose coefficients were recording these chromov witten invariants, we're going to look at its exponentials. So in other words, the partition function of, of the topological strength theory. Um, and uh, and uh, based on kind of physical considerations of this thing, more or less being like a trace over the Fox space for some um, uh, 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 quantum field theory, one would expect that partition function to admit uh, a factorization in the following uh, form that I'll try to unpack for you uh, now. So, so this partition function is going to be factored into a, a product over all uh, integral first homology classes for our Lagrangian, and then a uh, uh, product over all integers um, k. Now the factors in these products, in this infinite product, are all uh, what are called quantum dilogarithm functions, right? So, so, it's, uh, so, so what is this thing, uh, quantum dilogarithm? It's a uh, formal uh, power series in uh, variable z, whose coefficients are formal uh, Laurent series in variable Q. Now, what is variable Q in our enumerative context? Well, that Q is the exponential of our genus counting parameter lambda. Okay, so, so we're kind of mixing up um, all, all genera in this, in this uh, re-expansion. Uh, and so, so then each one of these factors in, in this product is quantum by logarithm of this new parameter Q to the K times uh, this uh, homology uh, class parameter x to the beta, and this uh, uh, this quantum dilogarithm of q to the kx to the beta um, appears with raised to some integer power n beta k of a. 
So, so really the, the non-trivial thing is that these uh, exponents are in fact integers. And if we fix a first homology class, uh, beta, then only finitely many, uh, as we vary k of these integers, will be non-zero. So we can in fact sort of package them into a Laurent polynomial um, uh, like we see here. Okay, so, so, so this is kind of um, uh, uh, a remarkable uh, way to repackage these open group wooden counts. Uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, in fact uh, also a very useful, uh, 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 fruitful uh, way to to compute these these open group wooden variants, um, at least in certain cases. So uh, the sort of prototype uh, of construction here uh, goes back to I, I think the work of Akinaki Kinvafa, um, around turn of the millennium, uh, where they computed the open group wooden invariants for so-called toric brains in C three. Um, Right. So, so this is one of the cases in which the, the invariants can, in fact, be uh, rigorously defined uh, mathematically. And I'll explain why in, in a second. Um, but, but anyhow, what are these, these uh, toric brains? Well, uh, the sort of building block for them is a, a singular uh, Lagrangian submanifold of, of C3 called the Harvey Lawson Kern. So, so, so uh, why it's called a, a, a Kern. Um, well, it's a cone over uh, uh, two torus T2, uh, as you can see from this explicit parameterization of it um, uh, uh, that we have here, right? So if we uh, fix uh, any non-zero value of this, this real, uh, so, yeah, so here R, S, and T are real, real numbers. Um, so if we fix any non-zero value of R, uh, we see that we allow S and T, T to vary, we get a, a, a two torus, um, product of two circles. Um, and uh, when we set R is equal to zero, it contracts down to a cone point um, at, the, at the origin. Um, so, uh, right. So um, for this thing, it's, uh, as we said, a, a conical uh, Lagrangian. Um, and uh, it's, uh, in fact, has a nice uh, U1 cross U1 symmetry, right? Um, uh, scaling in, 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 the obvious, in, in the obvious way. Um, and it's the, this, toric, uh, so this U1 cross U1 symmetry is why these things are called toric brains, and it's why we're able to, in fact, rigorously define the open row wooden counts in, in, this, in this case. So, um, right, so, so how, to, how to kind of visualize these, well, so first of all, how to define these uh, actual Harvey Lawson uh, Lagrangians, these toric brains. So, so under the, the projection, from uh, T star of R3 to the base R3. Um, so this amounts to taking the real part of the, of the coordinates. This Harvey Lawson cone um, is a branched uh, double cover of the three dimensional ball over four rays that, that meet at the origin, right? Um, and so, so let me flash forward just one slide to sort of sketch a picture. Um, so we have these four rays of which the covering is branched and, and they meet at this uh, point at the origin. And uh, so we uh, can smooth out uh, the intersection point of those four rays uh, in uh, three uh, distinct ways while preserving our U1 cross U1 symmetry, okay? So when we smooth, uh, so, so we can smooth along each of these, these uh, coordinate axes. Um, and when we do that, we'll smooth out this, uh, this singular cone into now a non-exact Lagrangian solid torus. Um, so it has topology of S1 cross D2 um, when, we, when we smooth out like this. Um, so here again, it is a picture of one such possible smoothing, right? Uh, and so now the, the resulting uh, three manifold, real three manifold we get when we smooth this way is once again, a double cover of the ball. And it's again, now branched over the smoothing of this, um, uh, of this kind of singular tangle. So now it's branched over really a, a sort of tangle inside of the ball uh, connecting these uh, yeah, points like this. Okay, so, so, so these are the, the uh, Harvey Lawson uh, Lagrangians, AKA toric brains. Um, so, so have topology of S1 cross D2. And uh, Akinaki Kinvafa proposed the following method to compute their open ground wooden invariants. Um, so, so let me kind of sketch out how, how the method goes. Um, so, so the idea is that it's going to be um, uh, K 
captured, uh, again, like I said at the beginning, by some kind of um, Poisson geometry of a moduli space. Um, and in this case, the moduli space to look at is so-called moduli space of A brains. So, so very roughly, you can think about these, these A brains as Lagrangian three manifolds filling the, the, the boundary uh, torus uh, with together with the data of a rank one local system. Uh, and then uh, this, this brain moduli space should embed into the uh, first cohomology of that boundary torus with perfect consistency star. And so that's some um, holomorphic symplectic torus um, with the symplectic form coming from the intersection pairing on the torus. And this brain moduli space should be embedded inside of there as a holomorphic Lagrangian submanifold. Uh, so, uh, so in this particular example, um, I can actually confirm for propose that, that the correct moduli space of, of uh, A brains using kind of a, a, a mirror symmetry type argument that that moduli space should be a pair of pants. Um, so, uh, so if you like C star minus a point or P1 minus uh, uh, three points. And so, so, so now we have this brain moduli space we need to understand its embedding as a Lagrangian submanifold of this uh, holomorphic symplectic torus given by the first cohomology of, of uh, T2, the coefficients in C star. So, um, uh, so, so to do that, um, let's uh, think now about the uh, inclusion of that boundary torus into the uh, one of these uh, Harvey Lawson Lagrangians, one of these toric brains. Okay, so so this, this boundary torus is of course S one cross S one. That Harvey Lawson Lagrangian, remember, is S one cross D two. And so the uh, the kernel of that homology push forward um, is going to be some uh, well, rank one um, uh, sublattice inside of the first cohomology of uh, T two. And and let's uh, pick some generator for that sublattice. Okay, um, and so, so that's some first homology class on the torus, and so dually that gives us a coordinate function on the first cohomology um, of, of, of T2, right, we, just by evaluating on the homology class, and let's call that, uh, that coordinate function Y. Okay, so, so Y is a coordinate on this uh, C star cross C star uh, given by first cohomology of T2. Okay, so, so now we have a, a coordinate, uh, uh, just one coordinate on, um, on this symplectic torus. And um, what we need to do is we need to complete uh, this single coordinate to a, actually a Dabu frame. Um, and uh, there's, of course, various ways to do that, right? Um, we can, uh, uh, for, for instance, um, if we pick some dual coordinate x, um, uh, canonically uh, concrete coordinate to y, uh, then we can multiply x by any power of y, and we'll have an equally good Dabu frame. Okay, uh, so this choice of of how to complete our uh, single coordinate function y to a Dabu frame is uh, this open Gumabutin framing um, uh, that I mentioned uh, in, in the sort of introduction, upon which all of these invariants will depend. Okay, so 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 the point is that once we have fixed one of these open group wooden framings, um, i.e. a Dabu frame on uh, this uh, holomorphic symplectic torus, C star cross C star, then we can write the defining equation of the brain moduli space, uh, which is a, a holomorphic Lagrangian inside of C star cross C star. And uh, the way it looks is of the form, this dual coordinate X times Y to the A plus Y is equal to one, okay? so. Uh, this um, cuts out, uh, 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 the, well, this gives uh, the a pair of pants sitting inside of this C star cross C star. Uh, and the the sort of key inside of, of Agnaglitschen Waffe um, is that the, the Uguri Waffe partition function that encodes these integer invariants is, uh, is, controlled by the quantization of the defining equation of this brain moduli space. So what do I mean by that? So, so we have this Darboux frame, uh, X and Y, uh, the, the Poisson bracket of X and Y is proportional to, to the product. Um, and now we're going to uh, uh, quantize that, uh, 
that Darbu frame to a pair of operators y and x um, acting on uh, uh, power series, formal power series in x with coefficients in some quantization parameter q, where uh, operator x acts by, well, multiplication by x, and operator y acts by dilating the variable x um, by factor of q squared. Okay, so now yx is q squared xy. So if these generate some kind of a quantum torus. Um, and the insight of agonization Vafa is that the Oguri Vafa partition function, um, which encodes these integer invariants, should be the solution of the Q difference equation, um, quantizing the defining equation of the brain modular space. So, for example, if we take, uh, let's look at the case where we have the zero framing, so to speak, so A is equal to zero. So, our defining equation is X plus Y is equal to one inside of C star cross C star. So because uh, remember Y X by dilation by factor Q squared. So, so this amounts to a difference equation for this, this partition function. It says that uh, Y psi is equal to one minus X psi. In other words, uh, psi of Q squared X is one minus X times psi of X, okay? And uh, we recognize the solution to this um, uh, Q difference equation as a character that's already appeared earlier in the talk, namely it's this quantum dilogarithm function. Um, okay, so uh, so so uh, uh, this is uh, kind of the um, uh, insight of Akinajic and Vafa was uh, that. Uh, in fact, one can compute these open group with invariants via computing the corresponding Uguri Vafa invariants, whose, whose partition function uh, is the solution of the quantum difference equation. Um, Gus? Yeah. So, so it all sounds very exciting and like a great like guess, guess work, which, which mm -hmm. works in the end. Yeah. Uh, is there any logic into all that? Yeah, th there is. Um, but, but for now, it's not obvious, right? From what you yeah, said, that, that's yeah. right. So, yeah, for now, it's it's not at all uh, not at all obvious. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But hopefully, I'll, I'll come to, to some some uh, explanation for, for the okay. logic. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Good. Um, yeah. Other questions about this? Uh, Okay, um, right. So, so, so in fact, as, as I mentioned, in this, um, in this uh, case of toric brains in C3, uh, where we have this nice U1 cross U1 symmetry, um, that symmetry actually allows us to use equivariant localization um, on, on these uh, moduli spaces to actually rigorously define the open group of Witten invariants. Um, so this was worked out by Katz and Liu. Um, and they were able to confirm that this Akinaki Schwafer proposal indeed does uh, compute uh, the open world Witten invariants for the for these toric brains as, as defined mathematically. Um, so so this, this sort of voodoo um, does in fact uh, give the right answer, at least in the case of, of the toric brain. Um, okay, so, so the um, kind of goal uh, for the, uh, of this project with, with Eric and Lin Wei is that we'd like to extend this Akinaki Vafa proposal for these uh, 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 Uguri Vafa partition functions to uh, more general uh, Lagrangian fillings of more general Legendrian surfaces in the Coast Free Bundle to R3. Um, so we'd like to do this not just for these you know, toric brains, but for some more general, more complicated kind of, uh, uh, of Lagrangians. And we'd also like to uh, understand the relations between uh, the auguri Vafa partition functions, or if you like, the open group Witten invariants uh, for different uh, such Lagrangians um, and Legendrians. So, uh, so, so what would the, the needed ingredients be um, in, in order to do this? Well, the first thing we need is some analog of the, the first ingredient for agonization Vafa, which is a, some modular space of brains. Um, and an embedding of that modular space of brains as a Lagrangian submanifold of um, so holomorphic symplectic torus. Um, so that's the first needed ingredient. And then the second ingredient needed ingredient is given some Lagrangian filling of a Legendrian um, surface, we need to find the kind of the correct quantization of the defining ideal of this brain modular space um, corresponding to the Lagrangian L. 
In other words, we need to produce the right um, polynomial system of Q difference equations whose solution gives the, the auguri varfa partition function. Um, and that, that quantization problem is, is somehow a, a, a tricky thing to, to solve because there's somehow a lot of freedom as to how one should uh, quantize um, uh, insert powers of Q in, in the correct way in order to quantize some uh, generators of, of the ideal cutting out some uh, holomorphic Lagrangian inside of the, a torus. Um, and the, the kind of message I want to convey is that really it's the uh, global Poisson geometry um, uh, of uh, in the picture that will provide the needed rigidity in order for us to really nail down what this correct quantization is. Um, so, so, so that's what I uh, kind of want to uh, explain for, for, for the rest of the talk. Okay, so, um, but, but before we, we get there, I, I want to talk about this, this wider class of, uh, of Legendrian surfaces and Lagrangian fillings that, that we uh, want to um, uh, make predictions about open grow wooden invariants for. Um, and I should mention that, that, th that this class that we're going to consider um, in general don't have uh, torus actions, torus symmetries. So, so the, the open world of Witten invariants lack uh, at this point a, a rigorous mathematical definition in the, in the context I'll be, I'll be speaking about. So, so uh, really we'll be making predictions rather than somehow than um, uh, statements about well-defined objects. But um, uh, uh, so, so that's kind of the setting we'll be in. So, uh, so what are these uh, Legendrian uh, surfaces and Lagrangian fillings that we want to consider? So uh, they're going to be uh, the, let's start with the Legendrian surfaces. So those surfaces uh, are going to be encoded combinatorially by the data of a three valent graph drawn on the surface of the sphere. Okay, so with, uh, let's say with 2G plus two vertices. Okay, so something like, for instance, in this picture on the left, I've drawn the uh, a one skeleton of a tetrahedron, um, this graph in red on the surface of a, of a sphere. Um, that will be an example with G is equal to one. Um, and uh, given such a, a graph, uh, we can consider the branch double covering of, of the sphere, um, having branch points at the vertices of the graph, right? So if we have two G plus two vertices, that branch double cover will be a surface of, of genus G. Um, so for, in, in this case of the tetrahedron graph uh, that we have here, we'll have a, just a surface of genus one um, as the branch double covering. So, um, so how do we use a cubic graph to produce a Legendrian surface in the coast of under two R three? Um, well, the idea is that we're gonna produce that Legendrian um, by, first producing its front projection and then uh, recovering the Legendrian from that front projection. So it's a little bit like um, if, if you've uh, seen uh, and thought about uh, Legendrian knots, uh, it, it's a uh, uh, sort of one dimension higher uh, version of the story where you draw the front projection of the knot in, in, in the plane um, and then the slope um, at the crossings allows you to, to lift um, to, to an actual Legendrian knot in R3. So here we're gonna be doing uh, one dimension higher. And so from our cubic graph, gamma, our trivalent graph on the sphere, um, we are going to construct a uh, map from the, the double cover. So this genus G uh, surface to R3, uh, which um, so along the, uh, which is sort of one to one away from the uh, 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 sorry to two to one away from the um, vertices of uh, away away from the graph itself. Along the edges of the graph, we have these uh, double points. So, so here I've um, uh, sort of drawn the the local model of, of of this this map near a vertex of the cubic graph. So along the edges, we have double points. Um, and, uh, and, and then at, at the branch point, we have uh, all, um, everything coming together. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so right, so, so this uh, somehow, right. And so, so uh, this is the local model near each one of the branch points. And then one can glue these things together uh, to define a map from uh, the uh, S gamma to uh, R3. And, uh, 
And, and uh, like we said, we're gonna use that, uh, the image of S gamma in R3 as the front projection to define a Legendrian surface in the coast fit bundle. Again, just like with knots. Um, uh, so we can unambiguously resolve the, these, uh, these double points and such um, uh, by regarding this thing as the, the front projection of, of the Legendrian. So, so we lift up uh, to the coast fit bundle, we in fact get an embedding of S gamma to, to the coast fit bundle. Okay, um, so, so, so these are the Legendrians that we're interested in. Uh, and uh, so, so the next ingredient is, is we want this um, moduli space of brains. And uh, the way that we're going to access this is using uh, this kind of beautiful um, uh, kind of algebraic uh, model for uh, for chi categories uh, that was developed by Nadler and Zaslow. Um, so, uh, so uh, what they tell us is that we can model the, the Fakaya category uh, of Lagrangian submanifolds asymptotic to a given uh, Legendrian at infinity as something sort of more, uh, less scary, at least to sort of an alg algebraically minded person. We can model that Fakaya category as a category of constructible sheaves on the base manifold R3 um, with having singular support in, the, uh, in, in our Legendrian surface. Okay, so, so in particular, uh, given one of these cubic graphs on, on the sphere, we can consider uh, the moduli space, it's called M gamma, of constructible sheaves on R3 with singular support in the corresponding Lagrangian, uh, in the corresponding Legendrian surface, S gamma. And um, uh, we can further restrict uh, uh, to sheaves of so-called microlocal rank one. Um, and uh, in that way, we get a, a nice moduli space. So in the uh, example at hand, right, where, uh, um, where our Legendrian is the one whose front projection looks, looks like this uh, locally, we, get a, we can get a very concrete description of that uh, category, uh, of that uh, moduli space of objects in this, um, in this category of, uh, microlocal sheaves of rank one. And that description looks the following way. So this the moduli space is the space of isomorphism classes of colorings of the faces of the cubic graph on the sphere by elements of P1. Okay, so, so graph coloring in the usual sense. So for each face, uh, we label it by a point in um, of, of the graph gamma, we label it by a point in P1. And if we have two faces that are separated by an edge, those faces have to be labeled by different points of P1. Uh, so, so that gives us some space of graph colorings. And um, then we uh, take the quotient by the action of, of PGL2 by changing, um, by, by acting on, on P1. Uh, okay. So, uh, so, so that's a very concrete combinatorial description of this um, uh, moduli space um, of uh, microlocal rank one sheaves um, with singular support in the Legendrian surface associated to the graph gamma. Okay, so, so, so now we have a candidate for this moduli space of, of brains. Um, it's this moduli space of rank one, microlocal rank one sheaves. And the next step, remember, in, in, in the uh, in, in the Eichenhoff kind of program, is to embed that moduli space of brains as a holomorphic Lagrangian submanifold inside of the first cohomology of the Legendrian surface uh, with C star coefficients, right? So um, yeah, so I have a typo in this slide I noticed. So so we we. Uh, the H1 of S gamma C star is of course C star, not C to the to the 2G, right? So it's a uh, rank 2G um, holomorphic symplectic torus. Again, the symplectic form comes from the intersection uh, pairing. Um, and we, we want to embed our, our brain moduli space in there. And let me uh, explain uh, with the help of this picture how to how to do so. So uh, so the, the, the kind of key point is that um, if we look at an edge of our, our three valent graph on the, the sphere, so on the double cover, right? Because that, that edge connects two branch points that we, on the double cover, that edge lifts to a cycle on, on the double cover. Uh, and that uh, we can look at the uh, homology class um, 
uh, represented by that cycle. And so then to, uh, if we have some uh, graph coloring, uh, like in the picture, we will be labeling the faces by elements A, B, C, and D of P1. Then uh, we can associate to that graph coloring the following uh, point of um, uh, the holomorphic symplectic torus, right? So it's a point of the first cohomology uh, with C star coefficients of S gamma. And so to tell you that cohomology class, I have to, I can tell you, tell you it by telling you its values on uh, a basis for homology. And so I'm going to tell you that its value on this homology class associated this loop um, for E, its value is given by the cross ratio of uh, the four points of P1 that are surrounding that, that egg. Okay, so, so, so in this way, um, given a graph coloring, we produce an explicit cohomology class, C star, uh, with C star coefficients uh, when we take this cross ratio. And, and by, the, by the fact that we, in fact, have a graph coloring, right, that, that we can have no uh, coincidences between uh, our AB, ABCD, we see that this, this cross ratio really does give us this element of C star. Um, so it really, really does uh, uh, what it says on the tin. Okay. Uh, Right, and so, uh, so so this gives us a uh, a map from our brain moduli space into this holomorphic symplectic torus of, of rank two G, and it's in fact also possible to uh, write down um, explicit generators for the defining ideal of um, of M gamma inside of that holomorphic symplectic torus. So let me let me illustrate it by way of example um, in our case of the tetrahedron graph. Um, that that we uh, that we we looked at before, um, so uh, so here's a tetrahedron graph, and its defining ideal is going to have a pair of generators for each face of of our our cubic graph, um, and uh, so uh, how do those those uh, those uh, defining uh, those generators look? So for instance, for this face that I've shaded in in, in yellow, uh, we have three edges around that face. Um, so the, the first relation says that the product of all three of those edges is equal to minus one. And the second relation says that we have this kind of alternating um, telescoping sum. So we start from one, and then uh, we uh, take edge E1, then we walk uh, counterclockwise around our uh, face and take X E1 times E2, and now with the plus sign, um, and and then we stop. Okay, so so if we had uh, more uh, edges around that face, we'd have more terms in the in this in the second relation. Yes. Yeah. Just just uh, just a stupid question. So uh, now because of the first relation, you can choose the starting yeah. point of the second relation anywhere. Brilliant. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, so, so in the second relation, I've sort of arbitrarily broken the cyclic order of the, um, you know, lifted the cyclic order to a linear order. But as, as Anton points out, um, if you will, will uh, uh, pick, uh, start, for instance, at a different edge, in view of the first relation, the generator you write down will be a multiple of, of the original generator that, that you had. Yeah. Uh, maybe one more, more question. Uh, could, could, probably I missed it. How do you guess those relations? Well, where, where do they come from? Ah, yeah, good. So, so that will be, um, that I'll have a good Poisson geometric explanation for uh, in, in, a, in a few minutes' time. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, right. So, so, so on the one hand, it basically comes from relations among uh, satisfied by cross ratio function, you can think. But, but there's a more direct way to, to somehow um, to, to compute them. Um, that will come to. Okay, but but so let's um, right. So, so now, wh where are we at in in this kind of um, uh, process? So we we have our uh, moduli space of brains, aka moduli space of rank one uh, uh, constructible sheaves, and we've embedded it into the holomorphic symplectic torus we want, um, and we've exhibited generators for the defining ideal of, of the embedding. Um, okay. And so, so now uh, what we need to do is we need to uh, understand uh, not just the uh, Legendrian surfaces, but also the Lagrangian fillings of them, whose, so, so now we want to understand the actual three-dimensional um, Lagrangian um, submanifolds that whose open-grow wooden invariants we want to compute or make predictions about. 
Um, so, and the basic idea for how we're going to build these is we're going to uh, kind of um, build them up by gluing together these Harvey Lawson solid tori. Um, so these original Agonagi Fafa toric brains, we're going to glue together to make more complicated uh, uh, Lagrangian submanifolds. Um, so, so to that end, let's quickly review the, the basic picture of these, these Harvey Lawson solid tori, right? So we started from this singular cone, of, and I'm drawing, I'm drawing the uh, base of the double covering, right? So these Harvey Lawson uh, Lagrangians are double covers of these, these pictures I've drawn here. On the left, we have the singular cone, and on the right, we have one of these smoothings um, uh, uh, into a, a solid torus. And again, the solid torus is a double cover of that picture, not the, not the picture itself. Um, okay, so, so these are sort of uh, the, the things like the picture on the right are our kind of elementary building blocks, um, and we're going to try and glue these together to something um, uh, to get something interesting. Uh, and so the uh, Lagrangians that we, we get when we glue this way are going to be double covers, again, of the ball. Um, and, and now, and again, they're going to be branched over some tangle um, that, that's gotten by gluing together the, these elementary tangles inside of the Harvey Lawson Lagrangians. So, um, uh, so, so right, so, so what, what we're going to do is we're going to take the three ball and uh, decompose it into a tetrahedra. And then inside each one of the tetrahedra, we are able to um, choose the corresponding smoothing of, of the corresponding Harvey Lawson curve. Okay. And so then, uh, so we have this uh, decomposition of the ball into tetrahedra. On the boundary of the ball, um, so on the boundary of the union of those tetrahedra, we get a triangulation of the sphere. And this triangulation is dual to some cubic, uh, some three valent graph. On, on the sphere. So, so let me draw a picture to, to kind of, uh, uh, is probably more uh, uh, a clearer way to explain. So, so we can kind of, um, it, and again, for sort of visualizing, it's maybe convenient to think um, in terms of a kind of dual picture where uh, we uh, represent a decomposition of the uh, sphere into tetrahedra uh, by, for each tetrahedron, we make a, a vertex. Um, so one of these purple dots that I've drawn, uh, and then faces of the tetrahedra will correspond to edges um, of, of, of this, this purple uh, graph. Okay, so we have a, a four valent uh, space graph um, where the vertices are tetrahedra and the edges are faces. And when we have two edges connected, we glue the tetrahedra by faces. So on the left here, there, there's a, um, a picture of uh, a, the, the uh, three ball. Uh, which has been uh, cut into three tetrahedra corresponding to these three purple dots. Um, and uh, on the uh, boundary uh, sphere, which is like the kind of surface of this triangular prism, um, we have a, a triangulation, uh, sorry, a, a, a three valent graph dual to the triangulation, and that three valent graph is drawn in red. So the graph gamma, this cubic graph gamma is drawn in red. And this purple uh, graph represents the decomposition of the, the, the ball into three tetrahedra. Okay, so, um, so we can glue these three um, uh, uh, singular Harvey Lawson cones together, um, as indicated in that picture on the left. And then inside each of, each of those Harvey Lawson cones, we have a choice about how we want to smooth it out into a Harvey Lawson solid torus, right? And so uh, remember that uh, the, the choice for smoothing, there, there were three choices of smoothing, um, which you can think about as the three um, uh, sort of ways of, uh, uh, of resolving this four valent uh, uh, purple vertex into uh, three valent vertices. Um, so, so I've indicated that, um, that, that smoothing um, uh, in, in the right, in the graph on the right by drawing these sort of small green uh, edges. Okay. so. Um, so, so we end up with a, with a picture on the right, um, where so, so now we have our our uh, three ball, which is this sort of solid triangular prism, and our tangle is given by the uh, components of the purple graph, right? So now we have a uh, uh, three components of our tangle. One of them goes goes up like this. Another one goes around the back like that. And another one on the front like this. So, so the resulting three manifold is, is a, a double cover of the three ball branched over that that purple tangle on the right. 
Okay, so um, so in this way we get a nice um, uh, 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 way of producing some interesting uh, uh, Lagrangian um, uh, submanifolds of T star R three. And um, the ones we're going to be interested in are those for which the tangle, so this purple tangle that we had on the previous slide, has no circle components. Um, uh, so, so one um, way to guarantee that would be to say that T is, for instance, a rational, so-called rational tangle. Um, but uh, at any rate, if T has no circle components, then it's not hard to see that the corresponding uh, three-manifold we get um, which fills the uh, genus key surface S gamma on the boundary. So that three manifold has first uh, cohomology isomorphic to just a uh, free uh, abelian group of, of rank G, so the Z to the G. Uh, and moreover, when we look at, so remember, uh, again, back in this original uh, Kishwafa story, we looked at the homology push forward from the first homology of, of the boundary surface um, into the first homology of the three manifold. and um, we looked at the kernel of that, a multi push forward, and we wanted to identify that kernel as giving us half of a Darboux frame of coordinates, right? Um, now, in the Akinaki Kafa case, it was sort of a fairly trivial thing because we only had a, a, a rank two lattice. So any rank one sublattice is going to be um, isotropic in there. Um, uh, but uh, in fact, in, in this uh, higher uh, cleanness case, the, the same turns out to be true, provided the tangle has no circle components. It, it's not hard to see that the kernel of that homology push forward is again um, uh, Z to the G, and that Z to the G is a, a maximal isotropic sublattice in this symplectic lattice given by first integral, uh, integral homology of, of, of the Legendrian surface. Okay, so, so, so again, um, the, uh, we, uh, our Lagrangian filling naturally gives us a, um, so to speak, half of a Dabu frame uh, on our holomorphic symplectic uh, torus. And um, again, just like in the Aganaki Kwafa case, we define an open Grimmel wooden framing in this context to be a choice, a complementary uh, maximal isotropic sublattice to this kernel of the homology push forward. So in other words, a splitting of that short exact sequence. Um, okay, so, so let me redraw this Akinaki Shivafa picture in, in, the, in, in the present context, right? Um, so it corresponds to this, this tetrahedron graph that we've um, seen a, a number of times. Um, now, uh, uh, remember that our, uh, in the original uh, notations, the generators of the kernel of the homology push forward um, in from the boundary to the three manifold, we call those things Y, right? Um, and so, so in this case, we have Y or Y inverse for some just choice of generator difference in convention. Y inverse we see attached to this uh, red edge um, over here. And why is that red edge in the kernel of the homology push forward? Well, notice that that red edge is uh, homotopic to this, this purple tangle strand, right? Uh, and so what that means is that um, uh, in the, uh, the Harvey Lawson Lagrangian, the uh, cycle uh, corresponding to that red edge, in fact, bounds a disk. Um, so, so therefore, goes to zero when we push forward in homology, um, because it's homotopic to the, to the strand of the tangle. Um, so that tells us that somehow that we, that we must have uh, Y or I suppose Y inverse attached to uh, this red edge here. And similarly to this, this red edge on the back, which is also homotopic to this purple strand. Um, and then our the choice of framing is, is genuinely a, a, another choice we have to make, which is a complementary um, uh, uh, sub, uh, uh, sub rank one sub lattice. And in this case, I've chosen it to be given by the cycle uh, associated to this red edge over here that I call X, okay. But that's choice and you could have chosen otherwise. Um, so change your framing will correspond to a change of Darboux coordinates um, as, as we said before. Okay, so, right. Um, and so now the, the, the problem is, um, so now we're really getting quite close to um, uh, what, what, we, what we need because we have to a uh, one of these uh, Lagrangian three manifolds, um, just boundaries of the Lagrangian surface. Uh, 
provided with user framing, we now indeed have a system of Dabu coordinates on this holomorphic symmetric torus. And we know the defining ideal of the brain moduli space inside of there. So now the whole problem is to find the correct quantization of that ideal. Um, okay. So, um, and so based on the uh, expectations from this Akinaki Fafa example, what, what we would expect is if we construct this quantization correctly, um, at the so we, we would hope that it uh, encodes the uh, open grove with invariance. So, so those, unfortunately, as I mentioned, are not yet defined, but um, we can ask for some mathematically well-defined properties that, that this, this quantization should satisfy it, right? So we should expect that there should be a unique uh, uh, wave function, so a unique solution to this polynomial system of, of difference equations. Um, and we would also expect, if this thing is really encoding these integer uguri varfer invariants, that we can write this wave function as a product of quantum by logarithms raised to integer powers. Okay, so, so what I'm gonna, uh, the, the construction I'm gonna describe in the remaining few minutes of the talk is how to construct a, a wave function satisfying those two properties, which therefore is a strong candidate for, for having some uh, enumerative meaning. Okay, and, and so now um, we can finally uh, see where the interesting Poisson geometry is going to enter the story and uh, provide the solution to this quantization problem. So, um, so, so the, the, the kind of key uh, point is that these moduli spaces of, uh, of brains, these M gamma, for all cubic graphs of the same genus can be glued together to give a single holomorphic Lagrangian inside of a certain um, Poisson variety. Um, so there's a single global Poisson variety, a single uh, global holomorphic uh, Lagrangian inside of there so that we can uh, uh, recover all of these moduli spaces by intersecting with appropriate open subsets. Uh, and, uh, and so then, um, uh, because this, uh, this global moduli space is in fact going to be a cluster Poisson variety, we can use cluster quantization to construct these, uh, these wave functions. So very briefly, what is this moduli space, um, the, this, this global uh, cluster Poisson moduli space that's going to save the day? So uh, we uh, get it in the following way. So we consider the moduli space of PGL2 local systems on a sphere with G plus three punctures, where G is the same G, so the genus of the Legendrian surface that we were interested in before. Um, and so, so we consider uh, PGL2 local systems on this punctured sphere, and uh, we equip them with the extra data of a decoration by a monodromy invariant uh, element of, of the flag manifold for PGL2, i.e. P1, uh, at each one of the punctures. Okay, so how should you th think about these punctures in the context of what we've said previously? Well, uh, you should think about these um, uh, punctures as they're going to be dual to, to faces of, uh, of, of the cubic graph. Okay, so, so, so this is this uh, nice moduli space, um, and we are, so, so it's, a, it's a Poisson moduli space, and we're going to be interested in the symplectic relief in that moduli space given by local systems where the monodromy around all the punctures is unipotent. Um, okay, so um, the great thing about this, this moduli space of decorated local systems uh, is that it's a so-called cluster Poisson variety. So uh, for each uh, uh, triangulation of the sphere with vertices of the punctures, or dually for each uh, trivalent graph on the sphere, um, uh, where the faces of, of that trivalent graph correspond to the punctures. So for each such thing, there's a symplectic toric chart on, on the moduli space. And that uh, symplectic torus is canonically identified with uh, nothing other than our old friend, uh, first cohomology of, uh, of the double cover of uh, the sphere branched at the vertices of the cubic graph with coefficients of C star. So the same holomorphic symmetric torus uh, into which our brain moduli space was embedded. So, so again, the picture is we have this global uh, Poisson moduli space, or rather a symplectic leaf inside of there, and it's covered by these symplectic tori um, that, uh, 
that we were studying from this enumerative perspective uh, before. So, um, so, so what, what the uh, cluster Poisson package tells you is um, also how the, these tori are glued together. So if we have two graphs, uh, gamma uh, and gamma prime, that are related by who, whose dual triangulations are, are related by a flip of diagonal, so sort of diagonal exchange like this, then the, the cluster structure gives us two isomorphisms of lattices between the corresponding first cohomologies of the double covers, so-called positive and negative mutations, as well as a birational um, uh, map uh, between the corresponding um, uh, toric charts called the so-called cluster transformation. Um, okay, so, so now finally we can define this, this global uh, uh, global uh, uh, chromatic Lagrangian. And so, and so to do it, uh, we, we just notice that inside this uh, moduli space of decorated unipotent local systems, there's a global holomorphic Lagrangian subvariety given by the condition that the underlying local system is trivial. Okay. So, um, so, so, the, so the, the local system is trivial. The only data left is the decoration. Um, and remember the flags that the punctures had, the points of P1 had to be invariant under the holonomy, but because the holonomy is trivial, there's, there's simply no condition. So, so therefore the only remaining data uh, is that of the, the uh, P1 decorations of the punctures um, or equivalently at the faces of, of the cubic graph. So in other words, when we intersect uh, the, this global holomorphic Lagrangian with one of our cluster tori, then we recover back exactly our moduli space of micro local rank one sheaves, which remember was identified with the space of graph colorings at the faces of gamma by elements of P1. Okay. So the upshot is that these brain moduli spaces for different cubic graphs all glued together into a single global uh, subvariety of this cluster variety that it makes sense to call the global chromatic Lagrangian. Okay, so um, so, so here, here's the picture when G is uh, equal to one, again, back in our um, uh, example related to Aganagic and Vafa. So, so in this case, this global chromatic Lagrangian is sort of quite literally a globe. It's a, it's a P1 um, and it's compact to find the original Aganagic Vafa pair of pants by adding, adding three points. Okay, so, um, so, uh, uh, so, so that's the story of mutations of the Lagrangian surfaces. The Lagrangian fillings, of course, mutate as well, um, as you can see from the, uh, the following picture, right? So uh, you can think about performing a, a diagonal flip of a triangulation as, in fact, gluing on a, a, a tetrahedron on top of, of the original triangulation, right? Um, and so uh, a graph flip is realized by gluing on one more tetrahedron by a pair of faces, as you can kind of see from this picture. And then, of course, um, uh, in order to produce uh, one of these uh, uh, Lagrangians we're interested in, we have to then smooth out uh, that singular Harvey Wilson cone um, into a solid torus. And there are two possible ways that we can propagate the, the tangle to the boundary of the new surface, corresponding to nothing other than our positive and negative mutations. So. Okay, so let me be a little bit brief about that, but somehow try to come to come to the punchline. So, so the point of so what's so great about having this cluster Poisson structure? Well, it, it's quite a rigid thing um, uh, because it, it, the um, entire uh, cluster Poisson variety admits a canonical quantization. So, so we chartwise quantize each of the quantum tori as we saw before, and then the uh, there's also a canonical quantization of the gluing maps. So, um, uh, and, and that quantization of the gluing maps is, is determined by uh, nothing other than our old friend, the quantum bag algorithm. So what we show with Eric and Lindway is that the defining ideals of this brain moduli space inside the toric charts can be quantized in a way which is compatible with the quantum mutation maps, right? And, and this compatibility of the quantum mutation maps is a really strong condition that, that uh, sort of pins down the quantization um, effectively, uh, completely. Um, and uh, so knowing such a quantization lets us deduce the existence of, in fact, a unique uh, wave function, uh, which indeed satisfies the aguri for integrality. And in fact, gives us the recipe for how to compute that wave function. So, so let me still just a, a minute more to explain, explain this computation, which is also the, the sort of uh, gives the proof of the main theorem. So, so the, the idea is to start from a very special cubic graph, um, which uh, sort of has the shape of a necklace. Right, so for, for genus cube, we have G plus one beads. Um, 
And the neat thing about this necklace is that it admits, in fact, an exact Lagrangian feeling, um, which corresponds to the sort of tangle uh, that you can see here for the genus one. Um, so the tangle strands that are sort of homotopic to the, the sort of uh, edges of the beads of the necklace. And, um, and uh, so uh, because that, that filling is exact, um, all the open and wind invariants in this case are just going to vanish by Stokes' theorem. So the corresponding wave function is just going to be equal to one. Very easy to compute. Um, right. And so, but, but now um, th this lets us, in fact, um, say, say quite a lot by, the, by this global uh, structure. So what we show uh, is that for, for any um, Legendrian surface, uh, Lagrangian filling, that we can get from this standard genus G, um, G kind of necklace by a sequence of uh, cyan mutations and changes of framing. So cyan mutations means gluing on these Harvey Lawson tetrahedra in a way that the tangle propagates through nicely. Then for, for any such uh, um, uh, data, there's a unique wave function annihilated by the action of the quantized chromatic ideal. And that wave function satisfies the Uguri Varfer integrality. Um, right. And, uh, and yeah, so, so, so in this way, the kind of global Poisson structure of, of, of this, um, of this modest space of local systems when quantized uh, uh, gives us a unique solution to our, our quantization problem. Okay, so uh, yeah, so uh, I think I'm uh, out of time. Uh, so, so let me uh, uh, stop there and thanks for listening. Oh, well, thanks a lot. Well, questions or comments? M maybe I have the following, well, somewhat naive question. So yeah. there are uh, all these people more on the algebraic side who study so-called dialogarism identities or quantum dialogarism identities. Yes, yes. <laughs> do get whatever products of quantum dialogarisms so um, how does your story fit into that or how, how, how is it related? Because right there, there are people who try to classify different types of those dialogarism identities. Uh, how, how, how is it the kind of, yeah. kind of what you, you're right. doing? Is it yeah, part of good. it or is it orthogonal to it? Yeah, let me try to, to say a few, a few words about it. So, um, so, so what, we, what we really use in, in this, is to, to prove this theorem it is the fact um, that we uh, have, so to speak, a representation of the quantum cluster variety. And, and so, so what it, it really means is that, um, so we have these charts associated to, um, to ideal triangulations or, or to these three valent graphs. And for each um, flip of the graph, we're going to assign some operator acting on our, on our Hilbert space, on our vector space. But, but just um, just to make it precise, this is kind yeah. of standard, is it right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. is standard. Yeah, that's right. Um, and where the dialogue with identities enter is showing that that representation is in fact well defined. So if you have a path, uh, if you have two different paths between two triangulations, then you should get the same uh, operator acting on your Hilbert space. And that's where the where the dialogue with identities are kind of crucial. In fact, in this case, it's just the Pentagon identity is is sufficient. Um, but but yeah. Um, Okay, thank you. Uh, more questions or comments? So, so, so maybe, uh, so, so back to this Lagrange and then to the yeah. corresponding wave function. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so how is it um, from the point of view of the cluster variety? Mm -hmm. um, ah, so yeah, what, good. Mm -hmm. what, what is special about this Lagrangian or what, how, how can kind of, is it some kind of cluster Lagrangian in some sense? What, what, what can, can you say from that point of view? Suppose as, so I, I don't know about other people in the audience, but I know nothing about this, uh, whatever, Oguri Vafa stuff and-, and, and Sure, so, sure. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So, so let me explain how to, how to uh, perhaps to even answer the, the earlier question about how to see these, uh, um, these kind of defining relations, right? Um, so, so what what do these? Uh, so, so here and in, in this setting, these x's are um, these. Uh, uh, if in sort of in terms of type null theory, sharing coordinates, or in sort of fock Goncharov terms, x coordinates. And what they tell you is um, 
how to build kind of uh, a, a graph connection on this um, on on this red graph, which, which produces your your local system. So they tell you how to factorize your uh, uh, parallel transport matrices as you move along edges of this this red graph, or in fact, a sort of ribbon graph thickening the red graph. And and so, how would you derive this th these two relations? Well, what you would do is you would for this um, uh, right. And so remember that the punctures on the surface live inside the the faces of this red graph. So you would compute the um, holonomy around the puncture sitting inside this, this orange um, egg, and you get some two by two matrix, um, upper triangular, because it preserves the, the flag, the point in P1 in, in, inside of the, um, inside of the uh, face. And uh, what the and then you will simply because you want the local system to be trivial, um, you will simply set that matrix to be the identity matrix in in P G L two, and uh, and so this uh, second condition, the the additive one, will correspond to the vanishing of the one two entry, so to speak, and this multiplicative one will correspond to the entry on the uh, diagonal being equal to to to, to one. Um, so. So yeah, so, so, so that's how you would sort of e easily derive the, these defining relations from the, this perspective of, of, of cluster plus on rays. That they simply be, you simply compute the holonomy and just ask for that holonomy to be trivial. Okay, okay, thanks a lot. Um, all right, uh, any more questions or comments? Well, if there are no other questions, uh, thanks again. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thank, thank you. And uh, so thank you, everybody, for participating. And uh, uh, so we meet again in two weeks on Global Post. So thank you. Bye-bye.